this is now time for the tube. You're going to see live bands, so remember, turn it up. These people are going to go in there, and we're going to have an absolutely insane time. From now on, you'll be watching Fantastic Tube. Well, here it is, the studio where it's all going to be happening. For the next five months, you're going to be able to see live music, interviews, my stomach getting bigger week by week. In fact, things that have never before seen on a live TV show. So here it is, the studio. And what can I say? One small step for pop music, one large step for fat girls. You know, it really was just fun. And it was kind of like free fall television where um, nobody ever put any restrictions on you and nobody ever told you kind of what to do and 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 so my view of the tubes kind of colored by the fact that since then I've worked on other shows and that's what makes you realize how unbelievable it was because it's once you work on other shows where you're told what to do the whole time and it's totally tedious and it takes forever to do everything then you really appreciate what it was like on the tube because it really was genuinely anarchic, I think, in the sense that they did not give a toss. They just went for it. Don't keep pulling sorry, me. I'm, I'm not, sorry. you know, I'm just like, just, you I'm know, sorry. an object. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I'm a person. Thank you. Thank oh, you. God. Um, come on. They all came up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, an object. That wasn't contrived. That was the main thing about it, was it? It genuinely was no, just a bit I, shoddy. I, I was just saying that, yeah. It genuinely um, was good when it was good, but that was just by chance. <laughs> yes, a, lot of, a lot of it was diabolical. It was by accident. <laughs> a lot of it was very shoddy and just, just not very good, but it mattered little because at least it was true. You know, there, It wasn't pretending to be anything. It wasn't. At least we were honourable, yes. Yeah, so uh, that's that then. I have to walk sideways because my towel's so small. Excuse me, do you not want to get any less? Are you both doing that one together? Yeah, yeah. it's got a problem with that. No, I haven't got a problem with it. Yeah, we're saying this is a bit of a problem. I was just, was just trying trying to and I don't know whether that would be a good thing or not. Well, no. this is how the tube was. Okay. Right. Um, so, let's see the first item. Living on free food tickets. Watering a milk from a hole in a roof where the rain came. What can you do? Tears from your little sister. Crying because she doesn't have a dust without a patch for the party to go But you know, she'll get by Cause she's living in love on the common people Smiles from the heart of a family man Daddy's gonna buy you a dream of good too Mama's gonna live it just as much as she can And she can Getting that first appearance on the tube was a very credible way of breaking through Because, and because the whole thing was live uh, and you really, you really had to prove yourself. Um, it was a great way to be able to come across, and the buzz afterwards when we'd done it, and they invited us back again that very next week. There is a vibe that you get that's so much different to um, somebody miming. It's 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 a much better atmosphere when you've got great bands on and they're and they're doing their thing um, with no real restrictions. You know, they just go out and do a good performance, and uh, you've really got a great atmosphere. It's de very difficult to do on TV, actually, but they managed to get it week by week. Yes, I think it's really important that any music program sets its own agenda and that it isn't it isn't controlled by other record companies or the latest fad in the enemy or Q magazine or, or whatever. And in a sense, we really didn't care. I mean, there would have been no opportunity for people like Julian Cope to be on television. I mean, Julian Cope, where would Julian Cope go? I mean, he's a great artist and 
Malcolm would have no problem with him. And the, um, the jam couldn't. I mean, they were growing up. They, you know, they, they weren't a pop group. They didn't start as a pop group. They couldn't keep going on to these, these Saturday morning things, you know, so they would go on a show where they could really do what they did really well, which was to play, you know, play live. And I think that, that was great, because that, that really was a catalyst. It really sorted out the, you know, the wheat from the chafe, you know, of like the guys who could really do it. The tube was uh, was pretty inf influential for uh, for me because. Uh, it was all run by Geordies, and I come from the same place. The timing was perfection. It was a, a great scene of music, all sort of change, and we were there right at the right time. Basically, the reason the tube was really good was because it was broadcast from Newcastle, which is a great place, I mean, let's face it. And, uh, and the fact that uh, everybody who wanted to be on the tube had to go up to Newcastle gave it a certain kind of atmosphere, because, you know, you, you know, the sort of Gosforth Park Hotel on Friday night, you know, used to be a pretty happening kind of place. You know, you, who knows who you'd meet in the bar, you know? And uh, I think the fact that it took every, you know, took all the sort of pop stars out of their normal environments and up to the sort of frozen, bleak wasteland of the Northeast, you know, back to some kind of absolute reality, I think must have helped it enormously be influential. When we said we're doing it from Newcastle, everybody said, they will not come, the stars will not come. Ask Tina Turner, Elton John, David Bowie, they all came. Every one of them that we wanted, I think. Uh, we waited for Elton for a good while, we finally got him. He was the last one, we'd done everybody in the world. Me on the beach with Brian Ferry. At, at, uh, Where you first met your wife. That's right, yes. On the same day, she was with her husband. <laughs> no, I think that probably people imagined that we were man and wife, uh, but of course we weren't. Um, my mother, even for a long time, on top of her piano at home, yeah. had a photograph of me and Paula instead of <laughs> me and my actual sort of... Proper wife. Yeah, yes, exactly. I think people that became a blurred issue in people's minds. Probably not so much in Bob's or anything, but... but uh, no, it was blurred in his mind. But we, we became a husband... We, how you realised you were becoming a husband, television, a uh, husband and wife, which is an interesting uh, uh, thing. But there again, you were a television husband and wife who uh, uh, people only expected the worst of, you know, they only expected sort of a drug frenzied orgy or something from them anyway, so... I think it was all right. Our next group, I'm not allowed to introduce because you might have thought that the lead singer had given me one. It was in fact, the lead singer, the lead singer in fact did give me one of these records, which are their brand new record. Well, it was definitely mad. I mean, the whole thing was crazy. Um, but the great thing about it was you had like, when I was on there, I was set up on one stage and uh, I think the first week we had Lords of the New Church on the stage right next to us. And the week after that, it was the Gap Band, <laughs> which is pretty wide. Uh, choice of music. The new bands, I think, were, the, were very much the life and energy of the programme. You know, people like Paul Young, this bunch of kind of quite overweight and yobby Scots guys who were shot on the beach at CM Colliery called Wet, Wet, Wet. I remember the lead singer with a big earring in it, you know, which I'm sure he'd hate to see back now. Thinking about my 
but it was kind of the weekend starts here and certainly from the music business but for a Friday night every record company would be turning their TV sets on around about 5.15 We did a band who were then unsigned called Frankie Goes Hollywood and we had a night out with them and they at that time had two ladies then called the, the Leatherettes I think and I knew the video was going to be a bit special. When, when we started, uh, one of the ladies sat on the lens. I thought this was going to be a bit different. And turned out, and it was Jules' birthday actually, when we shot them in uh, Liverpool. And um, I can remember my peer, who used to keep a diary, said uh, the morning after, last night we did a, a band called Frankie Goes to Hollywood, which consisted of two gates, two gays, two straights, and two ladies. Something for everyone. <laughs> was this sort of spot that uh, um, my, the, the Tube did where they took a, an unknown band and they made a video of them. And uh, <laughs> the Frankies were wearing pretty pretty outrageous outfits. So I think they were wearing things, uh, something called bum splitters, where they, they don't actually, not no underpants or trousers, just some sort of jockstrap affair. The whole thing looked kind of bizarre. <laughs> And I thought, my goodness, that song's that song is so blatantly about sex. Relax, don't do it. When you wanna go do it. Relax, don't do it. When you wanna come. In a way it was very dirty, I think. But but appealing. Whoa. When you wanna come. I thought that's a hit that's really is a hit song. I'm sure I could make that into a hit song. Who else wasn't there? That's true. We had them all on. You name them. We, we had them. Em. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now about to have a chat with um, you two who are in Dublin and we're live via a satellite and they can see me and I can see them. Can you? Yep. Yep. Yeah? Hello. Hiya. You look lovely in bed, by the way, Paul. Oh, thank you. I'm sure you do. Um, now, um, what sort of things have been inspiring you for, the new, for this new album? Right now, it's you, all the way. Jules did anyone that was over 50, and lots of people who were blind. Anyone blind, you did, didn't you? I did the talented people. And I did the crumpet. 
<laughs> yeah, and I think that was, that was I did, <clears throat> basically. I did everyone that I fancied, and you did everyone that you, you like. I admired their performance and playing capacity, <laughs> yes, and their poetic and artistic uh, gifts. That's it. And well, I like did people, too. You like people who just look like they'd be a good sort of bit of pinup. Yeah. Now tell me, Sting, what we really want to know is how come you get your gear off so often? Virtually every picture, you've got your shirt off. So come on, I come. Well, I don't know. It's... <laughs> Why do you think that is? Well, I've got a good body, isn't I? Are you very vain? <laughs> no, not vain. The photographers like my body. Do they? I've gone all red. I feel quite hot. Do you think that um, it was a... You're in mm. enough trouble as it is. Why? <laughs> I think part of the charm of, of any live TV show is you're never quite sure what's going to happen. We had a, a, a band on as part of the Red Wedge tour, right in the middle of the miners' strike, which at that time in the North East was very, very sensitive. And un, you know, unrehearsed, they, they brought an unemployed miner. They stopped the song halfway through and brought an unemployed miner onto the stage on to do a rant against Mrs Thatcher. And on strike for 35 weeks, a Durham miner. In classic sort of tube tradition, and uh, pure fate, his mic went down. So it, it didn't go out on air. However, there was a kind of backlash because everybody said, oh, the tube suddenly lost its credibility, you know, Martin Gary's a, a, a fascist so-and-so, he pulled down the guy's mic and it wasn't, it wasn't working in the first place. <laughs> oh, are we on? I think we are. <laughs> Oh, yes, well, what a constant. Please don't bother to write in saying, well, that was a bit of political boss. We couldn't hear what the Durham miner was saying. But he hadn't actually told us he was going to do it, so we didn't have his mic turned up. Bad accident, never mind. Often the best parts are, you know, the warts and the things that go wrong. And, you know, um, I mean, sometimes it kind of went just a little bit too far. It's Friday. It's half past five. And the pubs are open. My name is uh, Thingy, and this is the tunnel, uh, the hole. Uh, when Rick Mayle was on, in fact, we've there's lovely footage of this. Rick Mayle starts the tube, and he says, "Hello, it's Friday. It's five thirty, and the pubs are open." And then it vomits yeah, into the camera horribly. Um, and uh, and a man in Oxford called the police. I don't know what he thought they were going to do. Oh, yeah, well, send a squad car straight up there, you know, we're not <laughs> overrun with ram radio and whatever. <laughs> we'll just ram along there and sort that up. I've called you so many times today. I guess it's not true what your girlfriend said. Cause you don't ever want to see me again. And your brother's going to kill me at he's six feet ten. I guess you call it cowardice. But I'm not free back, so go on. Favourite moments? The six weeks you had off for swearing. That was quite, that was quite, that was the best bit. It's easy to look back now and laugh, but I mean, there were a few long, dark nights of the soul. Believe me. <laughs> it was a trailer going out live. I mean, this was in the, in the middle the of the end. Noddy show. Yeah, it was a trailer going out live beforehand, just after Noddy, and it was an inadvertent and regrettable slip of the tongue, but in my mind, I was slowly thinking to myself, Right, so B there, or B, I thought, well, I'm not going to say square, because that's what a stupid thing that would be to say. And in my sort of confusion, I said, B there, or be a completely ungroovy, and then use a regrettable slip of the tongue. But, in fact, um, people complained, and the time T said, oh, no, he didn't say that, it's OK. But some smart ass in sort of Oxford or something had uh, taped it. I'd just like to read out uh, uh, some of the people who've sent in letters of thanks uh, to me, just very quickly. So we'd like to thank, uh, or letters of, uh, you know, support for me in these hard times. Uh, Paul McCartney and his wife, um, Kate Bush. Donald Luck and his brother, Rudyard. Sir Reg Cray. Uh, Doreen, uh, Josie Barb, Trish of Husbands Bosworth. In retrospect, when you watch programmes now, it still looks slightly shocking. You know, people being sick out of their noses at sort of ten past five and kind of the endless swearing slip-ups that did seem to happen. You're Mel and this is Jimmy. And of course, you have got a super... We've got nice fish and chips here for you. I would, yeah, a, a nice tea. Practical props. Now, these are expensive. We work at the Beeb, actually. You don't get practical props. 
fact. This is actually worse than the fucking bees. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> As you were saying. You know. So, we've had a, we've had a super... Um, and super cut. It was, you know, rough around the edges because it was done by young people and people in the TV world that had just started, I think, and, they, and everybody was learning. There isn't there a TV programme that could make anybody's career at the moment. And the Tube did make a few people's careers, not just the Frankies. You two were nothing, nothing. They were mere tiny little Irish boys until the Tube. Very and talented ones. Very talented, hugely talented. I've always felt that Bono was huge. And um, in fact, they ring us regularly, even now they ring us and they say, I'm in the middle of a world tour and I owe it all to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, in... 1983, we released our third LP. It was called War and it did really well for us. In fact, it was the first time we ever made money from playing live. And with that money, we decided to make a film of the group live, Red Rocks. It was called Under a Blood Red Sky and it was directed by Gavin Taylor. Malcolm Gary and the Tube team, well, they were the first to play it. And they played it a lot. As a result, U2's become, well, the biggest kick-ass rock and roll group in the world. When we were doing it, it was the greatest rock and roll show in the world, there was no doubt about that. And I just hope it comes back. We just heard the sad and the bad news that it's all over for the best rock and roll show on TV for the Tube. So, we got a little tune we want to play for you. Y'all. I'm a rolling stone all alone and lost for a life of sin i pay the cost as i pass by i hear the people say he's just another guy down the lost highway tell her that just a deck of cards and a jug of wine And a woman's life 